Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller. I'm Susie Younger. An African-American licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed therapist. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias. Anything that marginalizes and oppresses. As a white woman, I ask the questions white people are too afraid to ask. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, Susie and I will have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? We are so excited for our next guest today. She holds a doctorate of psychology and is passionate about exploring and unraveling biracial identity work. Dr. Johnson conducts workshops and classes, as well as providing psychotherapy on the subjects of interracial and biracial issues. She's been featured on everything from CNN to the Oprah Winfrey Show and many other multi-platform, multimedia platforms. We are honored to have her on today to share her story, her truth, and learn about the ways in which she uses her work to make change and difference. We also happen to know that we all share a certain profound love of furry beings. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> How'd you know that? <laughs> we do our homework. Wow. Welcome, Dr. Johnson. <laughs> wow. Welcome, Doc. Thank you. Thank Happy you. I'm so you. excited to be here. Excellent. So, you know, you and I have been connected through social media for a minute. But I yes. realized I don't, don't really know your background with you. I, I don't really know who you are, where you come from. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a significant story from your childhood that would sort of characterize who you are today. Wow. <laughs> Simple question. Well, yeah. But you know what? Actually, I will talk about, since we're talking about interracial relationships and biracial issues, um, but this also dates me, but I get it's all right. I'm dated. I'm way dated. Don't worry about it. Um, well, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, California, what we now call South Central. Um, and what I call the real riots, the 1965 riots, one of the fondest memories I have of that is uh, we literally lived in the epicenter. Uh, I could give you the streets, but I don't remember them. It's not important. But I do remember the day this, the riot started. My uh, father owned a business on Normandy. And so we would drive down Normandy to Broadway and whatever street we lived on. But um, the day the riots began, I remember we were driving in the car, my mother, my father, my brother and I um, were sitting in the back seat. And as we drove towards home, we could just see huge plumes of black smoke in the sky. And I remember my dad said to my mother and my brother and I, get on the floor of the car. And from that moment, we drove into the driveway and we went in the house and we were on lockdown for seven days because my dad was afraid because my mother is white um, and we were fair skin uh, to have us come out of the house in the middle of the riots. So that kind of was my beginning to understand that this thing that I have in my house is not okay outside of my house. Wow. I wow. That kind of, yeah. Gives, I mean, yeah. That, so, that's an incredible uh, memory. And I would say that that set the stage for you to develop a deeper understanding of what it meant to come from an interracial household. It, it really did. It really did because, again, every day on TV, I saw this conflict. And it just, and I think this is, this is true of a lot of biracial children. You know, obviously, this is many generations ago. But what my work talks about is the intrapsychic developmental process for a biracial child, how they negotiate what's happening internally versus what's happening and what they're being told outside themselves. Um, and that's often where the conflict comes in. So you jumped ahead, so I'm gonna go with it. Tell okay. me, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, my work, I've, I've worked over the years with a lot of interracial families and specifically biracial children. Now it's much more common, but I find that the ideology is we've not moved much. 
um, in terms of how we identify people of mixed ethnicity. Uh, and it still is quite taboo. Even, you know, we had our biracial president and one of the questions I'm asked most often is why didn't bi uh, Barack Obama identify as biracial? And the answer is simply, it would have been political suicide. He would have lost his base. Um, so it's still tab taboo, but I think that for children of mixed ethnicity, internally, we start out with, this is normal. You know, like every child thinks their family is normal, whatever that means as a family therapist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is just how it is. And, you know, as the child then goes out into school, depending on their experiences at home, um, coming from a secure base versus, you know, avoidant or uh, anxious base is going to significantly impact how they face what's dealt to them in terms of their racial identity. So one of the things for the biracial child is they don't have necessarily a race to identify with when they go out into the world. They don't have a group with whom to identify. And very often they have to pick and choose based on ethnicity. Again, things are changing, but I'm, uh, in terms of how we see children of mixed ethnicity, I find that the hypodescent theory or the one drop rule is still mm -hmm. very much in play. And for those who don't know what that means, it means if you have one drop of black blood, and I'm talking specifically white black, then you only identify with the black race, which still kind of holds today. So what is it about people identifying as mixed race that seems extremely important to you versus identifying with one particular part of their identity um, to which they feel more aligned? What, what do you think the strength is, is, is in identifying as a mixed race person versus the other? Well, let, let me just say, in having worked with many mixed race people, it really, again, I see it as a developmental process, meaning initially, it's kind of, this is who and how I am. There is no question of one or the other. I'm both. That really, I do believe that that's where children start. When they go out into the world, depending on what part of them gets attacked, well, naturally, they're going to hide that part of themselves to fit in, especially during adolescence. But I also have seen the process of, okay, attempting to identify with only one, then attempting to identify with the other, depending on the circumstances, which internally creates self-doubt, feelings of self-worthlessness, um, inadequacy, which can manifest in depressive and anxiety, an anxious symptoms. So it really does become a mental health issue when you have to hide a part of oneself. Like, mm -hmm. So in terms of me working with people of mixed ethnicity, I accept them where they are. If they are only identifying at one, it's not my job to make them accept both parts of themselves, but to try and understand what that's about for them and have they ever had the option of accepting all parts of themselves or is this a reaction to society? So when you talk about acceptance, you know, it's, it's, um, it's tricky, right? Because what's acceptance in the house is not what's acceptance in society, but it also has to do with which racial identity plays a stronger lead, if you will, uh, in the household uh, in terms of how the mixed race child identifies. You know, I've read research that says, you know, if the more oppressed person in the family and the parent um, system takes a lead, that child is more empowered in terms of the marginalization of the community um, to which that part of the family identifies or that part of the parent structure identifies, and then learns from the less oppressed parent how to be more responsible with what access to privilege they may have. Do you have any perspective on that? Do you think that's true or old news? Well, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's news, but the key word is oppressed. If one has to oppress or be oppressed to be in a family situation, this is what I talk about in interracial families. Um, I, I just uh, did a lecture on if you want to support your biracial child and his or her or their identity, 
you have to be clear on what's happening for you because the biracial child more often than not is not going to look like either parent, not always, but meaning they're gonna be a different skin color. Children don't notice skin color differences until the age of about three. So there's a lot going on in terms of development. And as we know as therapists, what's really important are those first few years and how mom and child bond, how dad and child, how the caregivers bond with the child. And this is what I'm talking about, being prepared to go out into the world from a secure base versus from a conflicted family. If conflict is over my, you know, it's my uh, issue of being proud of my heritage and you have to be on a lesser uh, platform for that to happen, then there, there are other issues going on in the, in the family. Um, and it's important to support the child in terms of their personality, their development, and then race, as we know, race, gender, religion, sexuality, those are secondary to personality development. So if you had to think of one significant theme that emerged about uh, from being raised in an interracial environment, what would you say that was? That um, personality development <laughs> supersedes <laughs> these other secondary characteristics. So what was it in your personality development that gave you the core to figure this out? Well, from, you know, and I, I don't like to talk a lot about my stuff because I think it gets in the way of people exploring what's going on for them. But I, I will answer that. You know, I, I remember being, like I said, watching what was going on in the news, uh, listening to Dr. King speak, um, watching how whites and blacks walked hand in hand together and realizing this, this, is, this is what's supposed to happen. And, and the, the other thing is, um, I just remember being very young, being in the store with my mother and people come up and say really cruel things. Like, are you adopted? Now that just, to me, it, it stuck with me because it's like, first of all, why would anybody say that, you know? So those kinds of interactions, and then just, again, growing up in the 60s, very turbulent time, but a very um, inspiring time for me. Even though I, I was very young, it was very inspiring. Um, I went to a predominantly black school. And in those days they brought in black instructors to teach us black history. And then I would get made, be made fun of because I had a white mother. So it, it, was, it was very conflicted. It was very confusing. Uh, we didn't have a lot of resources. One of, the, one of the reasons I wanted to do talk shows in the early days is because I would listen to how they would talk about people of mixed ethnicity. And it literally made us sound like we had little horns coming out of our heads. So it just was in response to everything that was around me that seemed so uninformed. Um, and from that, I just started doing it. So, you know, I want you to say a little bit more about um, what it means to understand oneself in a world that forces you to choose your identity for parents who are raising mixed race children. Because I think a lot in my experience, both in my family and outside of my family, it seems like kids are not invited to uh, embrace both parts of themselves equally. I don't think it's conscious. I don't think it's intentional, but I do think it happens. And so what's the message that parents need to understand and perceive in terms of you know, raising a healthy uh, mixed race child? Okay, great, great question. And again, it, it really, you know, this to me is more a parenting issue yeah. than, than a racial issue because, it, you know, we have to talk about everything with our children. But in order to do that, the parents, first of all, have to be aligned in, you know, they have to be the parental unit. They have to establish, they have to nurture boundaries, um, praise, and do it consistently for the child. So when the child goes out 
into the world, they know that they have a safe place to come back to, meaning mom and dad are gonna support me in whatever the conflict is. So when it does become racial and they do start asking questions about that, parents, and this is what I'm talking about, parents have to, and I would say this for anybody, explore their own stereotypes, their own biases. What have they heard in their families of origin? How do they interact with their extended families with regard to race? Um, for one of the things that I talk about, and I do have an article that, you, that people can go to on my website under the blog, it's called A Biracial Child Self-Esteem, 10, 10 Effective Steps. And I give you know point by point what I'm talking about here. Um, but parents have to present a united front in terms of supporting the, uh, the personality development of the child through those four things that I talked about. Then when it comes into the racial issues, again, parents identifying what their issues are, how they got together. And I will say this, I find, and this is the research will prove this out, that interracial couples are more often going to talk in advance about things that monoracial families or couples tend to take for granted. Um, so they talk about, well, how is your family going to or not going to accept me? Now that could be based on race and it could be based on a lot of families just don't like whoever you're going to marry or whoever you partner with. So it's about, and again, if I have to say uh, there's the crux of my work is helping people separate true racial, uh, racial issues from psychological and emotional issues. And I can give an example of that if, if that's helpful. Sure, sure. Okay. So let's, let's take an adolescence. We know developmentally for adolescence, this is a time of who am I? Mm -hmm. And very often for the biracial person, if they're the, the individual is, let's say they're acting out in school, they're being disrespectful to their teachers, they're being disres speaking disrespectfully to their parents, or they're stealing, or they're engaging in something that's questionable behavior. Very often, the default for the biracial child is, well, they're confused and they're angry because they're biracial, as opposed to, this is an adolescent that may be angry. Let's get to what's happening with them and help them deal with their anger and then deal with the racial issues if in fact that's what this is about. So identifying the emotional aspects of you know, negotiating uh, adolescence versus racial issues and then helping put that together for the child. Look, if, if a child is raised in a mixed race household and they have, you know, strength in both parts of themselves, you know, that that's more probable of a healthy integration process where they're set, both parts of themselves are celebrated, right? Yes. But so, but so often in my personal experience, you know, uh, when I've dated interracially, it's felt like, and what I've treated, um, you know, clients, it has felt like that one person has to give up parts of themselves to engage in that interracial relationship. And I'm, I'm wondering what that, what that looks like in a healthier situation where both parts are integrated equally, if that's possible, because that's what benefits the child most. Well, we'll say more when you say they have to give up a part of themselves. What is yeah. that? So um, for example, when I've dated someone outside of my race, it has felt like I have had to uh, lean into their culture more than my own. And it has felt conflicted if I come back and can't talk about my experience in, a, in an oppressive world where white supremacy reigns. You know, it doesn't feel like we're, we're speaking the same language because we have different experiences. And I'm hoping that these days it's easier for people to have those difficult conversations. Whereas in my day, it was like, you kind of avoided it and just, just kind of, you know, repressed it a little bit if you could, because you didn't want to deal with it, right? You know, that I, I think that that is such a valid point and it, and it still happens today. Let me just say that race, race relations, talking about race is hard. And even though I've done it just about every day, there are times when I really have to take a step back and say, 
I can't do this today. I won't do this this week because it is emotionally draining. So you couple just that stimulating topic of race with attempting to negotiate a relationship, mm -hmm. which is tricky in and of itself because now you've got people bringing you know, their own stuff into the relationship. It is difficult, but it can be done. And we're not going for perfection here. We're going for, can my partner be emotionally autonomous enough to hear what I'm saying, not try and dis diminish it, take it away, ignore it, and can I do the same? Can I contain myself in this relationship? And that's, that's just, that's when we're talking about, I don't know about healthy versus unhealthy, but a relationship that's sustainable is uh, identifying true intimacy and being able and, and knowing that we're going to get hurt in our relationships. How do we negotiate that hurt? Which brings me back to, you know, that's what we learn in our families of origin. Yeah. But it's, it's still just, it is hard. It really is. Um, and there, you know, there have, been, there have been many times when I've had to just leave a situation where I've had to, I could tell you, and maybe you and I will have a cup of coffee someday. And I'll tell you about when I did, oh, and this is for Susie as well. Um, when I did, it was a show called Oh Drama, and it was BET's Black version of The View. All hell broke loose. And yeah, so one day we'll talk about that. There have been times where I've just had to remove myself from the situation because, you know, I have to accept people are not willing to hear this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's, it takes a lot. It really does. Well, I appreciate your perspective. Uh, so I want to know if you have any more to say about the um, biracial development issues from an internal sense of regulation. I found that interesting. I, I do. I have a whole lot of that. Hopefully I have a book on it. Soon. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah. Well, um, well, again, really what I focus on is the, as I said, the intrapsychic developmental process of a biracial child. And if, as I heard you say, they are allowed and supported in a sense of self. So I want to start with a sense of self, whatever one's ethnicity is, that's what children need. And they get that through nurturing boundaries, praise and limit setting. So if parents can be on the same page and consistently do that, um, for the biracial child, there will come a time when they notice, okay, Susie or Johnny or whomever said, you have funny parents or there's something wrong with your family, how they are able, first of all, that that's hurtful and it's mean. And then you come back home and you talk, you're able to talk with your caregivers about you know, what's happening, what this means, what race means, and all of those kinds of things. But I believe that for the, it's, this, these are my theories that for the biracial child, it's not a question. It's, it's just it's, as normal as it is for anybody to say, I'm black, I'm white, I'm Chinese, I'm Mexican. Um, it's for the, for the biracial child, I'm both. And they do bear a legitimate claim to both. The problem with the, the one drop rule and people um, abiding by that is understanding the history of that, where that comes from. That comes from, that was given in slavery days so that if a slave was raped by a, a slave master and the child was able to pass, pass meaning they didn't look like they were black, they labeled them mulatto, which many people are, familiar with the term, but it means a child half black, half white. So they were able to label them so that they could continue um, slavery and racism throughout the generations. And to me, if, if I abide by that, if I say, well, I'm only this, then I'm just carrying on slave mentality, slave owner mentality. Mm -hmm. For the biracial child, Inside, that's where we start. We go out into the world and we have to find a group to fit in with. Not necessarily because of race, and, and, but children want to fit in, especially during adolescence. It's a time of who am I? So if they're 
finding people that are supportive of that, it's going to be easier. But if they feel okay with it themselves, they may, you know, they may say, well, I'm, I'm black. I'm, I'm only black because all my friends are black. And it's just easier. You know, kids had enough things to deal with that that just may be easier. But I've also heard people, a lot of biracial people say, I'm neither, which I take as a response to this forced identity is I'm just gonna reject everybody because I'm angry, because I, I feel inadequate, I feel not accepted, um, and that hurts. And then as you go along, depending on what kind of experiences the individual has, at some point there just comes this melding of, okay, I'm both. They may not get it out there, but internally, I, I can't, for, for a, a child, to say, you have to pick one parent. That's cruel. We wouldn't say to any monoracial child, pick one parent, you only get one. You only get one side of your family. So I think it's quite destructive when we force this identification which, with either side. And again, that starts with parents having some understanding of this is not their experience, this is their child's experience, as we would expect for parents of any uh, ethnicity. So or that's any... the internal sense of regulation, being able to regulate comfortably, sort of being in two worlds and being okay with it, or be having two parts of themselves and being okay with it. Yes, yeah. we're in one world. We're in one world, <laughs> and yeah. our, our world consists of both. Yeah, that's, that's even better, yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's, yeah. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I think you, Susie, and I agree with this, which is that racial issues are a clinician's responsibility, and it's their obligation to work on themselves before stepping in a room with anyone, let alone That's someone true. who appears different than themselves. Now, how do we enforce this? Because I think the BBS needs to get involved. And, and I don't see it. <laughs> I don't. Camp I, don't. Get <laughs> I can see them calling me for my license tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. But but I just mean in terms of like, you know, responsibility, like it's an ethical responsibility. It's an ethical responsibility. And I've gotten into more clinicians, particularly white clinicians who are like, I don't see race. I don't see it as a problem. And yes, I do treat people of different races. And I think that's unethical. It, it is unethical. Well, okay. Years ago, I uh, did um, a lecture for the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists, in which I talked about this very issue. Um, because when I, you know, years ago, there was this whole thing of race matching in therapy, which I just is, is just absurd to me. Um, yeah. this, is, this is something that's going to have to be worked on for many, 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 many years. And I don't know that my profession will ever get there. I can only hope that they do. I, I hate to sound so pessimistic, but I remember the days when everybody was hanging out a shingle saying, I'm multicultural competent. Uh, no, you're not. No, because you sat in a class for, you know, an hour. People are really reticent to explore their own issues. Now it's, it, it is changing. I have to say, even I'm shocked in the last few years, um, at how people are maybe more willing to take a little bit of a more self-reflective um, aspect of this in, in looking at their own stuff. But, you know, it, I have to do it every day. And I think I've been doing it every day, but I still have to do it every day um, because I want to make sure that I stay objective. And that's what I meant by, I don't like to talk a lot about my stuff because I want to remain, I see myself first as a clinician. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think it's so important, the question that you're bringing up that, it, that it, at least attention is brought to it. If you're not willing to work on your own racial stuff, then you become a danger in the room. Yeah, um, there is a, a, a clinician and I'm, his name is, not coming to mind, but he does believe that white clinicians should not see people of other races. He does believe in that that race matching. I think that's what you're referring to. Yes. And I, yes. I want to hear more about 
why you think the way that you do about that? Well, I this may be oversimplistic, but this is how I've always responded to that. Okay. Um, do you wear a size seven shoe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Well, you, <laughs> well, okay. Well, then I can't work with you because you don't wear the same size as me. Mm. It's, it's not about me. It's about what the client brings in the room. And if you're uncomfortable, it, you know, like, like we're taught, this is basic psychotherapy 101. If there's a client that you can't work with, and, and I've said this, if you have issues with biracial people, I'd rather know that going into therapy so that I can go somewhere else. And if you don't know that about yourself, this is, this is where, you know, it takes the self-reflection and the willing, willingness to look at our own biases and our own prejudices. And, and this is, you know, counter-transference and transfer. The, those things I very much believe in going into the room with someone, you know, I've worked with people, I, I don't know what being black to someone means being black to them. I don't know what being biracial means to them. It's my job to hear it from them. But the base, the, the foundation of psychotherapy is two things, confidentiality and trust. And those trust, again, is going to supersede race and anything else in the therapeutic setting. If the client feels that they can trust and be respected. But here's the thing, it gets complicated because yeah. you know, I find in the classroom when I'm uh, trying to teach future clinicians about this, it gets complicated because you know there's such a fear of the imposter syndrome in our field, and I'm sure it is in other fields as well. But because there's such a fear, people, don't often connect to their humility. And the humility is so important in taking ownership of what you don't know. And so trying to deal with that imposter syndrome and be honest about what you don't know, and maybe I'm not the therapist for you, I have concerns about people who are you know, confronting therapy or going to therapy for the first time and confronting issues that they've had their whole life, that they might sit in front of a clinician who hasn't connected with that humility and, and does feel that imposter syndrome leading that I have to treat everyone. I'm capable of treating everyone. And they really aren't. That can yeah, but Yeah, but if they're starting with, I can treat everyone, then that, therein lies the, the challenge. I, you know, I, I agree. One, of, one of my uh, favorite memories from being an intern at the Maple Center, which was awesome, um, one of the questions they ask us is, who could you not sit in a room with and don't tell us child molesters? And, and I immediately, I got it, because every, every, that's what everyone would have said. And it really is about self-exploration. Uh, you, you, and, you know, I don't know unless they do some real strong, um, I don't know that there's an answer to that question, yeah. because I don't necessarily think it's only about race. I think it's about where the person is willing to work on themselves and 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 really, you know, examine their own families of origin and what they are bringing into the therapeutic setting. Uh, I hear you. I don't think there's a singular answer for that. And yeah. I and I, you know, I do think that race always ends up being connected. Unfortunately, I'd like it not. Oh, to I, be I I don't mean I don't mean at all to. Yeah. Do um, is when I was looking for a therapist, when, you know, when I first, first looked into therapy, I didn't want a black therapist. I didn't want a white therapist. Mm -hmm. That's all I knew about therapy. Yeah. And, and I trust that our patients, because for me, it literally is holding their souls in their, in my hand till they don't need that from me anymore. It's about giving them, allowing them to experience that whatever their ethnicity is. So um, yeah. yeah, I really do think it's, a, it's, it's about being a therapist and this takes a lot of training and a long time. That's a all lot of training. A Thank lot. you for saying that. And I just want to emphasize that a lot of training. Yes. You know, you don't yes. come out of school and become proficient at everything yeah. that we've you know, gone through over the years. It, um, <clears throat> you know, you talked about trust, <clears throat> excuse me. You talked about trust and 
one of the things I often say in the classroom is don't expect your clients coming from marginalized populations to come in having a full-fledged conversation about trust. You know, within your, your therapeutic relationship, there is, particularly if you're of different cultures, it's challenging because if you represent what is oppressive in the macro and society, you can't come in just assuming that this person is gonna trust you and you're gonna trust this person. There needs to be a conversation about what trust looks like and how do we build trust? And I think that assumption is problematic in our work. Well, I and and if that's what you're hearing me say that it's- No, that, no, not you. No, no, no. Oh, okay, no, what I'm saying is as a clinician, it is our responsibility legally and ethically. Yes you know, to assess, is the client getting what they, they may not be able to tell us that, but in our tool bags, that's, that's part of us being clinicians. And establishing trust takes time, even in the best of uh, therapist client matchups, it takes time. And I just don't think that that's based on what we look like outside. I work with a lot of trans and, and I'm so proud of this because they came to me. And I think it's because I have a sense, not that I articulated this, but I know what it feels like to be marginalized. Mm -hmm. And that kind of emanates, they experience that. Uh, they feel it in the room. It's not, it's nonverbal. It's not something that's articulated. And that when I'm talking about trust established in the therapeutic setting, that's that's what I'm talking about, which doesn't come with a color. Yeah, and I don't I don't mean to say that uh, make it sound like you were saying that. That's one of the okay. things that I feel challenged by helping people understand oh. is that you don't just become a therapist and then you go into the room and now you have right. trust. So I right. wanted to push that out with yeah. you. So I'm glad yeah. to hear your perspective on that. Yeah. What do you want potential clients to know when they are looking for you or anyone else in a potential therapist? Well, I think, you know, when people call, what I say is, I, I will listen to you. We will have some sessions. You let me know. We assess this as we go along. Um, is, are you getting what it is you need? You can tell me if you're not, and I know some people can't, but you know, it, it, it really is them coming to me because they are in some kind of crisis. We know that that's usually when people reach out is when, when they're hurting. And so I try and do my best to hear what their needs are in the moment. Um, and then, and then go from there. I don't know that I could exactly articulate it. It just, it just kind of happens. Yeah. And I know that wouldn't work with the BBS, but <laughs> <laughs> at this point. <laughs> well, the one thing that I say to people is don't go to a therapist who hasn't gone to therapy. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's number one. That's the number one that's, question out of that, your mouth. That's yes, it's number one. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and, you know I, one yeah. one thing I do say to them is I say, you know, interview them like you're interviewing them for a job because you are. And yeah. you're employing them. So if you you ask questions that you want to ask, and it may seem scary, but this is the time to do it. So that that yeah. Absolutely. I, I love that phrase that you hold the client's soul, you know, in your hands. I love that. It's powerful. Thank you. I, um, it, it's true. It's, it's true. Um, it, it just, it, I feel such an honor to do the work that I do every day. And the older I get, I, I just know that this is a job that's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is one that I find so rewarding. Yeah. Well, that's a blessing. So talk about the focus of your practice. I know you do much more than what we focused on today. I just really wanted to get into this because I thought you had some awesome perspectives to share, but talk about what else you do in your practice, would you? Well, I, I, my, I work uh, anxiety. I treat anxiety, depression, trauma. Um, I work with individuals, couples, families, and um, 
you know, I, again, people come to me, I think, because they, you know, word of mouth is the greatest gift that can be. And so there's something that's happening. And I, and again, I know I'm not the therapist for everybody, but I do, um, you know, I use a variety of orientations because as a, as a clinician, as a seasoned clinician, I try and meet the client where they are. And I know that one orientation is not a fit all. It's what, what do they need? So it, it really is uh, having a sense of different orientations, what the client needs, what they want. And, and in the first uh, initial phone call, a lot of people go online, look at my picture and they go, oh, I found a black therapist. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I am old school psychodynamic. Freud would be turning over in his grave if he saw I had a website up. <laughs> but I, I do, in the, if they do come to me with that, I do let them know I identify as biracial, I am biracial. And if that's an issue, then we need to talk about that in our initial conversation. And most people, the, most people respond by going, oh yeah, I am too. So, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So what's, what's next for you? What's <laughs> going on? We I, heard about the book. What else? I, I'm, I'm hoping the book is soon. Um, I'm trying to get up to speed on all these podcasts and all the technology and all that. So that's about it, that's about it for me. Other than I, I love practicing. And now that we've had to make this dramatic shift again, I was another one of those that was like, I will never do therapy on a computer. <laughs> well, and then in one weekend, I find myself so... I, you know, I'm really hesitant to say what's going on next. I just want to do this. I want to continue practicing and uh, just see where it goes with what with what we're dealing with now. And what we're dealing with a lot. I mean, this yes. pandemic. Yes. Feels yes. like it's never ending. So we are dealing with a lot. Yes. Uh, Susie, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Well, I, just in reflecting, um, as a white baby clinician, I've only been licensed for a little over a year. And, you know, what you said about the classroom, taking one class, which is all I got at Antioch, and having to continue the work on, on my own, but for so many white clinicians that don't even take the multicultural class or the one, whatever they call it now, is just so scary and that it's out there and that people are just putting shingles on their websites. They treat everyone and everything and how you, you talked about it, how irresponsible and how harmful it is, you know, and it just that was what's really resonating for me. And also the way that a multiracial identity can't be wrapped up the way people want it to be in a pretty little bow. Yeah, yeah. Well, but I mean, obviously I do this because we're getting the word out. And, and you know, again, as a clinician, we know that we can't change the world, but some people will hear this and things will change because of this. People will hear a piece of this and say, okay, I'm a white clinician. Have I had any classes? What do I know? What do I even know about in my family? What I've heard, you know, little passing terms, things that go right into the unconscious and then we act out on them. So just the fact that we are talking about it, that's why I do this because yeah. that's why we do this. It will, it, we've seen change, we see it happening now. Um, but again, it does start with working on self. And what was drummed into me in my, um, my time at Antioch, as well as in my doctoral program is be objective. You're too close to this subject. That's all I wanted to write on was biracial issues. And, and it allowed me to develop you know, the scientific part and, and, and try and stay as objective as I can. And not everybody wants to be biracial. Not everybody is biracial. And you know, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to be a clinician. So I think whatever, whatever the outside looks like, if you can get inside and work with those things, that's what's gonna change. That's what it's gonna, gonna bring about the change we're looking for. 
I think that's a perfect place to end. And I also have a love for psychodynamic theory. I was trained at Smith and that was a big part of what we focused on. So I appreciate all the references there. <laughs> so you've already spoken to this, but let me, let me uh, end on one final note we ask everyone, which is, what do you think you're doing to change the narrative? Um, the, what everything that I just talked about in terms of realizing that when I step in the room, my, my job is there as a clinician to hear what's happening for the individual who has sought me out. And to, you know, one of the things that I tell my clients when, when they're down on themselves and, you know, working through trauma is, hey, you, you survived this. And by the way, you called me. I didn't call you. I didn't look in the universe and say, hey, come on in. And, and, I, and I mean that sincerely, is they have survived, they have struggled, they've gotten here, and they're with me, they're working with me in the time they allow me to be in their lives. Um, and so I respect that, and I honor it. And, and I know that the therapeutic process can be tough, it can be hard, but it's, it's worth the work. It's worth the work. Perfect place to end. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Oh, thank you for having me. This was so great. You know, you have to promise to come back. I, absolutely. Okay. I like to get that. I like to get that recorded, so I can just play it for, so I can play it for people later on. You said it right here. You said you're coming back. Yes. Yes. I'd be honored. It, it was. It's uh, great to spend time with you in uh, semi realness. I really appreciate. I know. That. And soon, hopefully, real realness. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And thank you again. Your perspective you is definitely needed and I appreciate it so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank okay. you. Take care.